Hey everyone. Okay, so I know that GeForce RTX is coming, but Pascal isn't dead. Not by any means. Not yet. I mean, in recent weeks, Nvidia has quietly released a new 10 series card and I actually find it rather fascinating. So here it is, a three gigabyte version of the GTX 1050. So here's the thing, when Nvidia releases a new architecture, it typically starts at the top of the performance stack and works its way down with new chip revisions. GTX 1050 and the 1050 Ti featured the GP107 processor, and as these products were released somewhat later on, we should expect its replacement to arrive quite a long way down the line. So to cut a long story short here, Turing is obviously the future, but its impact on the budget range of GPUs won't be felt for some time, and for budget orientated gamers, the 1053 gigabyte is well worth a look because quite frankly, three gigs of VRAM needs to be the absolute minimum for a gaming GPU targeting 1080p gameplay right now. But here's the thing, GP107 has a 128-bit memory bus, which means that in terms of VRAM configurations for a consumer product, two gigs and four gigs are the only real options. And perhaps not surprisingly, that's what you get with the existing 1050 and 1050 Ti. So the notion of a three gig product, well, it's kind of weird. And Nvidia's solution is, shall we say, unconventional to say the least. To address three gigs of RAM, the 1050 Ti's memory controller is downgraded from 128 bits to 96 bits. And so by extension, memory bandwidth drops from 112 gigabytes per second to a mere 84. And owing to the way Nvidia's architecture is set up, the ROP count also gets a similar 25% drop from 32 to 24. On paper at least, that's a lot of cuts that makes that extra gig of memory possible on GP107. Now, NVIDIA does attempt to mitigate these cuts on the new cards. So VRAM aside, the main difference between 1050 and 1050 Ti is a drop in CUDA cores. For the 3 gig 1050, NVIDIA actually delivers all of the available processing power, the full Ti spec, but combined with that cutback memory interface. In effect then, the 1053 gigabyte actually has more in common with the Ti than it does the vanilla model. In games where the primary bottleneck is compute-based, we should expect the new card to outperform the 2GB model as it has 128 more CUDA cores. However, where memory bandwidth is key, Nvidia faces a problem in matching 2GB 1050 performance, and it's clearly hoping that the extra compute power will kind of drag it over the line to at least match the vanilla 1050. So yeah, let's just say that the benchmarks on this one are going to be fascinating. But first up, I want to take a closer look at the card itself, as I rather like it. There aren't actually that many 3 gig 1050s on the market right now. And of the models I've seen, most of them are too expensive in my opinion, closer to TI pricing rather than vanilla 1050. But the Gigabyte model I bought in is different. It was £128, just a few more than the 2GB version from the same manufacturer. And that's really how the new card should be marketed, effectively as a replacement to the 2GB version. And this Gigabyte card really is neat. First of all, yes, it's a dual slot card, but it's also half height, meaning that it will fit into a bunch of small form factor machines. It's like a stubbier 1030, if you like. And yet, in common with all of Nvidia's budget-orientated cards, there's no requirement for PCI Express power. It gets everything it needs from the motherboard bus. Next up, let's take a look at the ports on the rear. Dual link DVI is still important for a huge array of monitors out there. But yeah, there's DisplayPort as well. And yes, two, two HDMI outputs. There's genuine utility here for this card to run a range of cheaper displays simultaneously, but perhaps not in gaming. I mean, fundamentally, this is a 1080p gaming card. It's also pretty easy to whip off the cooler and take a look at how the bizarre memory configuration presents at the hardware level. Now, as I mentioned, this Gigabyte board is similar to an existing model, and I'd venture to suggest that this extends to the PCB as well. I mean, you can even see the vacant slot for the missing memory module there. When GP107 is a fully enabled TI, you'll get four one gigabyte modules. When it's the cutback 640 shader model, you'll get four 512 megabyte modules instead. 
It may well be the case that the 3 gig 1050 will eventually replace the 2 gig model completely. Those 512 megabyte modules may be more difficult to find on the supply side, making this 3 gig version a lot more easier for Nvidia and partners to produce. But yeah, cooler back on and I rather like this card. Easy to fit, preposterously low power requirements, virtually silent and it has the Pascal media block. So if HTPC is still a thing for you, you could do a lot worse than this. But really though, it's all about that bizarre memory bandwidth situation. 84 gigabytes per second for a GPU designed to outperform the base PS4 and Xbox One sounds like a compromise too far. So really, it's all about the performance, isn't it? First up though, a quick word on why I think the 1050 requires that extra gig of RAM. Look at the Ryzen 2 Raider benchmark here and you'll notice frame time stutter that doesn't appear on the TI. What's happening here is that the high quality textures I've selected can't sit in two gigs of memory. So performance is hit as data is swapped between VRAM and system memory. Next up, the division under DX12. Yeah, I'm pushing ultra settings here and a two gig card will work better with paired back textures. But the point is, that memory limitations are causing severe streaming issues here with malformed geometry and sometimes missing textures. And yeah, this is just on the two gig model, just to stress again. And yes, of course, the 1050 Ti does not have these problems as four gigs is enough for the game to work correctly. DX12 is a bit of a challenge for lower end cards generally because memory management is more the responsibility of the developer rather than the driver and that reaches its nadir here with our Battlefield 1 benchmark. On ultra settings and even on high settings with in-game memory management enabled or disabled, the 2 gig 1050 just collapses. Man, it's a slideshow here. Yes, DX11 with more restrained settings is the way forward here, but the point is that 4 gig cards just handle this without any problem. And you know what? Pascal's memory compression technology isn't bad at all to the point where 3 gigs is just enough for 1080p gaming with console equivalent texture settings. And we can see that here by looking at GTX 1060 3 gigabyte benchmarks. On all of the examples I've just shown, the cutback 1060 works just fine by and large. 4K textures, often under the ultra settings preset, well, they're off the table, but the next step down is usually fine, and 3 gigs is good for the 1060, and by extension, it should be fine for the less capable 1050 too, right? So we're gonna move on to performance now, and we have several topics to cover here. First of all, the whole point of this enterprise is to deliver more memory to gamers, right? I want to see VRAM-constrained situations to be no more impactful to performance than they are to the 3 gig version of the 1060 also based on Pascal technology. Secondly, it's about ranking the 1053 gigabyte alongside the two existing GP107 products. Now, in an ideal world, the card should sit between them, but in situations where memory bandwidth is key, we kind of don't want to see the new card slip below the vanilla 2 gig 1050. But first of all, let's address those three games I showed you earlier. Looking at the division, the 3 gig card sees the streaming issues completely resolved and the benchmark completes exactly as it should. This game is heavier on compute than it is on memory bandwidth, so it's only 6 to 7% slower than the 1050 Ti. But because it has that extra gig of memory compared to the vanilla model, it isn't constantly paging back to system RAM, and the end result is that there's an extra 38% of performance versus the standard vanilla 1050. First impressions then? Well, you'd say that this is vindication for Nvidia here and a better deal for gamers. Rise of the Tomb Raider's benchmark also gets a clean bill of health. In terms of overall performance, the 1053 gig sits slap bang in the middle of the other GP107 products. It's 9.5% faster than the basic model and about 8% slower than the 1050 Ti. But the point is that the frame time stutter we picked up earlier on the entry level 1050, yeah, it's kind of much smoother now on the 3 gig card. It's another example of the extra memory making a difference here. Extra performance, less stutter, it's another win. Now finally, the real test, Battlefield 1. Interesting one this, because on the one hand, 
it is no longer a slideshow. And yeah, the frame rate average is actually four times higher than the 2 gig 1050. Clearly with these settings and under this API, the extra memory makes a huge difference here. However, the 1050 Ti is 16% faster and its lowest one and five percent scores are vastly improved. Before a level begins, there are a few seconds of stutter, so there are clearly some issues here still. Personally, I'd recommend the DX11 render path here. You should be okay. By and large, we've established that in VRAM heavy workloads, the GTX 1050 is a big, big, big improvement over the two gig model in 1080p gaming. But to give it the biggest endorsement, we need to confirm that the memory bus restriction has been mitigated by the extra CUDA cores. I went into this one not exactly optimistic about the situation, but certainly impressed by the results I'd already logged in my memory testing. So let's dive in with the worst result for the 1053 gig, Far Cry Primal. The basic 1050 is actually 7% faster than the 3 gig revision, even with the HD texture pack enabled. Interestingly, the 1050 Ti is only 6% faster than the 2 gig card, suggesting that, yeah, compute isn't really what this title thrives on. Of course, Far Cry Primal is pretty old these days, but I've noticed the same reliance on bandwidth is there in Far Cry 5, which uses an evolution of the junior game engine. Crisis 3 remains one of my favorite go-to games, for testing legacy PC gaming workloads, and perhaps unsurprisingly, it's another title where the standard GTX 1050 bests the 3 gig offering. Crytek's texture streaming system works fine on 2 gig cards, so there's no memory advantage here for our new challenger. But despite its mammoth 25% loss of bandwidth and ROBs, it's still only 2% slower overall than the vanilla 1050. By extension, this is unlikely to be noticed that much in gameplay. GTX 1050 Ti, about 11% faster overall. Another interesting example here is Ghost Recon Wildlands. I'm running on the very high settings here, which for the benchmark at least, seems to be okay for two gig cards. Nvidia's rebalancing of compute and bandwidth results in an overall net gain for the new three gig 1050, about three to 4% overall. However, the 1050 Ti is about 11% faster than that. So this is kind of interesting. On the vanilla 1050, we have the full memory bandwidth, which is the same as the TI, which in turn has the full GP107 compute. The 3 gig 1050 is a TI, but with that hobbled memory interface. And you can see the variability that this compromise has to performance across the range of games. In this case, we're closer to the two gigabyte version of the card running this game, but it can go lower as well. Meanwhile, as we saw with the division, sometimes, your 3 gig 1050 is far closer in performance terms to the 1050 Ti. Kind of highlights the balancing act there that all the GPU manufacturers have to settle on between bandwidth and compute. So by and large, Nvidia's revised balancing act for the new 1050 seems to work out, kind of against the odds I'd say, and in a more surprising way than I thought. I expected more of the non-memory limited benchmarks to tank but out of the titles I tested, only one saw a really significant drop. And even then I'd still choose the three gig model over the two gig one because I don't really want to drop to medium texture quality or lower. And I don't want to hit memory swapping issues in DX12 games. Meanwhile, any boost to performance I get, I kind of see that as a bonus. And for the most part, even games that thrive on bandwidth, they're mostly okay. So here's another example, The Witcher 3. Overall performance here is by and large very similar to the two gig model, slightly slower, but imperceptible in gameplay really. So what's the competition here? Well, there were two ways of looking at it in my opinion, new and used. I've concentrated mostly in this review on Nvidia's other GP107 products, but I have mentioned RX 560. But the market there is a mess because we have two gig cards, four gig cards, we have cards with 16 Radeon compute units, other cards with only 14 that arrived later on. And yeah, that really annoyed a ton of people. Then we have cards with PCI Express power and cards that don't have it, which in my tests, well, when you don't have it, you lose a bit of boost clock. So in my benchmarks, I ended up testing two four gigabyte cards, 14 and 16 compute units, 
and equalize clocks at a factory OC level. In short, best case scenarios for both of the compute unit configs. The performance difference ended up being between 3 and 7% between 14 and 16 CU versions of the 560, so not exactly a deal breaker if you get a lower configuration card. But in all cases I tested, except for Battlefield 1 and Ashes of the Singularity versus the vanilla 2 gig 1050, Nvidia was just faster. It doesn't really matter about the market confusion with all of the different RX 560 specs out there, because our benchmark suggests that NVIDIA is the one to get. And the 3 gig 1050 is our entry level choice for a brand new GPU. But man, used prices are looking rather interesting right now. So I paid £128 for this GTX 1053 GB. And on the used market, that buys me a really good GTX 970, like the MSI Gaming 4G model, a card that monsters the 1050 and has aged fairly well over time. Performance on GTX 780 and 780 Ti hasn't aged quite so well. I mean, the 780 Ti at launch could battle it out with a 980, but yeah, prices are actually lower there now and sometimes surprisingly so. This may well be a topic for another video, but aside from some wobbles in DX12 only titles, GTX 980 is really holding up well if you can afford to spend a little more. By and large, it's on par with 1066 gigabyte, and sometimes it's even faster, and it certainly has more overclocking headroom. So yeah, there are options when it comes to buying in at this kind of price point. None of these alternatives will be as small. None of them will run without PCI Express power. So in that sense, none of them are as flexible as the GP107 products. But that's not to say that they aren't compelling alternatives. And that's where I'm going to leave things for now. Of course, like and subscribe to support work like this and ring the bell for instant notifications whenever a new DF video drops. And yeah, this video, like quite a few others we produce, relies on actually buying in product for review. No samples on this one, so if you do like what we do and want to contribute more, please do consider the DF Patreon. Just a small amount each month really helps, and yes, you get access to a massive library of pristine quality video. But that's all from me for now. Thanks for watching.